I'm Emily Boyd Storman, CEO of the ANRF, and on behalf of our board of directors, our scientific advisory board and staff, I'd like to welcome you to the spotlight on scleroderma. We're excited to have many of you joining us from all over the world, so thank you for your support. I would like to welcome the moderator for our discussion, Dr. Craig Walsh. Dr. Walsh is a professor of molecular biology and biochemistry and a director at the Multiple Sclerosis Research Center in the University of California, Irvine School of Medicine. Dr. Walsh is also the chair of the ANRF Scientific Advisory Board. Thank you for moderating this session today, Dr. Walsh. Before we get started, there are just a couple of logistical pieces of information we wanna share with you. One, the webinar is being recorded and we'll have it available on our website and YouTube channel in the coming weeks. And two, if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A during the webinar. If we aren't able to get to yours, please feel free to email us afterwards at info at curearthritis.org. Now let's get started with today's webinar and hear more from our ANRF scholars. Dr. Walsh, take it away. All right, well, thank you, Emily. And um, thank you everybody for, for joining us today to hear some really exciting work in the area of scleroderma. And one, one thing I'd like to say is a little bit about our mission for, at the ANRF. And so, um, you know, like a lot of organizations, we are a charitable, or, charitable organization that funds research, but we also have a really important mission, which is to foster uh, scientists and, and researchers in early stages of their career. And so this is a really important um, aspect of what our organization does. And we're delighted to have three folks who've been supported by the ANRF. Um, and so we're gonna hear some of the work that they're doing in their laboratories. As I mentioned at the, at the outset, um, uh, the, the organization supports early careers. And I should say that my very first grant from the ANRF my, my very first grant that I had as an assistant professor was from the ANRF, and so um, I'm certainly delighted to uh, to welcome these folks who are going to talk about some of the work that they're doing in their own careers. And um, we're going to talk today. We're, the focus is going to be on scleroderma, which is an autoimmune disease that's primarily um, an autoimmunity of the skin, although it can affect other tissues. And so, when we think of autoimmune disease, what we're basically talking about is our immune system. Uh, attacking our own tissues. And normally it's it's not supposed to do that. There are extensive mechanisms that are in place to prevent that sort of autoimmunity from occurring. Uh, but in some cases that can happen and that can lead to, to problems. Um, so so without further ado, and, and I should say as well that you know we'll hear something about why research in this area is so important so that we can develop um, new therapy for treatment. Uh, and so without further ado, I want to move on to um, our first invited speaker, uh, Roxanne Darbusse, who is an instructor in pediatrics from Boston Children's Hospital. And the title of uh, Dr. Darbusse's uh, presentation will be Platelets and Neutrophils Tangled Up to Fan Systemic Sclerosis. Dr. Darbusse. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for this introduction. So I will share my screen. Um, OK. And here. So I hope you can see the screen uh, okay. Yes. Okay. So um, today I'm going to talk about platelets and neutrophils in systemic sclerosis. So um, here we go. So uh, as I mentioned, Craig, um, systemic sclerosis, also called scleroderma, is a rheumatic disease that primarily we affect the skin, and I show here a picture of an affected skin that can affect also all the organ of the body. And it can also affect the lung as shown here. And when this happens, um, lung disease are the leading cause of morbidity and mortality in scleroderma. And uh, this is why uh, I'm interested in um, diffuse systemic sclerosis that affect patients with skin and lung involvement. Systemic sclerosis is a very complex disease and the mechanisms involved are poorly understood. And there is a lot of effort to uh, understand the disease in order to find new therapeutic targets uh, to uh, find a cure. So my studies, um, investigate the role of platelets and neutrophils in uh, systemic sclerosis. So what do we know about platelets and neutrophils? First of all, uh, platelets and neutrophils are two types of blood cells. Platelets are the band-aid 
of the body required to stop bleeding. And neutrophils are a type of human cells that help repair damaged tissues and fight infection. So because of their primary role, we don't really know what could be their role in scleroderma. So what do we know in scleroderma about those cells? We know that they are activated as they can contain mediators that can influence inflammation, fibrosis, and vasculopathy. That are three processes that are involved in scleroderma development. And more recently, it has been shown that um, platelet and neutrophil interactions can uh, lead to microvascular injury, which is the damage of the blood vessel during scleroderma. But we think that the role of platelets and neutrophils go further um, this role. That's why we wanted to investigate their role during scleroderma. So how do we study um, uh, scleroderma in our lab? So we use animal models as well as human samples. With the animal models, we have in the lab two different types of animal models. One is called hypochlorous acid model. Uh, the data that, were, that I will present today are from this model, but we also have another model called bleomycin. And these are very easy model to induce into the mice. So we uh, inject daily the drug into the back of the mice for several weeks. And after that, the mice will develop scleroderma. These models are very relevant to the human disease. The mouse will have autoantibodies, will have inflammation, vasculopathy. But what is interesting for us is that these mice also develop fibrosis in the skin and the lung, like in human. So now I'm going to present you some of the data that uh, we found in the lab. So first, we find that neutrophils our driver of fibrosis during, SS, during systemic sclerosis. Systemic sclerosis, I uh, write it as SSC uh, in my slide. So uh, what we look at first is uh, in all our animal models that we confirm also in human, we look to see if neutrophil were activated to see if our model were working. So we, to check neutrophil activation, we collect uh, blood from the mice. And when the neutrophil are activated, the neutrophil will have different expression on the molecule on the surface that will change after activation. So for example, two markers that we look at are called MAC1 and L-selectin that are very common markers that will change following activation. For example, during activation, MAC1 expression will increase and L-selectin will decrease. And we use a technique called flow cytometry to look at this marker um, on neutrophils. And this is what we found in scleroderma neutrophils. Here, I, uh, HOCl for hypochlorous acid. We found that MAC1 was increased and L-selectin was decreased showing that they were activated compared to the control neutrophil, the LC neutrophil. So this showed that neutrophil in scleroderma were activated. So our next question was, where are neutrophil uh, involved in fibrosis? So to know if something is involved, we remove them and see if the, the, the things we want to see is still there. This is exactly what we did in the mice. We remove the neutrophils with an antibody called 1A8, and we look if fibrosis was still there. So we, uh, we have an antibody called 1A8 that we inj inject to the mice. The neutrophil will uh, be removed. We inject we, uh, or hypochlorous acid, and um, the mice will develop fibrosis in the lung. And then we collect the lung and do some um, staining into the lung. As reference, this is a normal looking lung and we stain the lung to detect the presence of the fibrosis. So in blue will be the scarring and you can see uh, in, um, in the normal lung there is not a lot of fibrosis, this scarring that build up during scleroderma and the lung appear very well uh, structured with uh, here are the alveoli and um, and when we have scleroderma in the presence of neutrophils, like here, you can see a total loss of the architecture and the buildup of this blue scarring uh, part and a lung that appears much more dense, like 
uh, you can see here. When we remove the neutrophil from the mice with the 1A8 antibody, the lungs appear much more healthier and much more forward a uh, normal uh, looking lung with less compact and much more uh, like an architecture much normal. We can also quantify um, the amount of fibrosis in the lung and we can see that in mice where neutrophil have been depleted, the fibrosis is decreased compared to the one that contain neutrophils. So we confirm the involvement of neutrophil in fibrosis by injecting scleroderma neutrophils into healthy mice to see if the scleroderma neutrophils were able to induce fibrosis to a totally healthy mice. So we collect neutrophils from scleroderma mice or healthy mice and inject it to healthy mice. So when we inject healthy neutrophils to a mice, the lung appears normal. But when we inject, pretty much normal, I would say, but when we inject, Scleroderma neutrophils, you can see that the lung appear very fibrotic. So neutrophils, once again, can drive the fibrosis in this experiment. So the next question for us was, how the neutrophil can become activated? In my introduction slides, I mentioned that platelet and neutrophil interact with each other. And we well, it's well known that uh, platelet interaction can act in other Disease such as cancer or other uh, rheumatoid diseases. So we look if platelet can have a role to uh, activate the neutrophil during scleroderma. So first we look at platelet activation in our model, and uh, as with neutrophil, we we collect some blood and look at marker of platelet activation. And two marker that we look at are P-selectin and annexin-5 that these two markers express on the platelet surface that increase during a platelet activation were also found increase in scleroderma platelet compared to the healthy platelet. So during scleroderma, platelets are activated. So then we have removed the platelets. We have mice that don't have platelets and mice that have platelets and to those mice, we also induce a scleroderma model, and we collect blood to check neutrophil activation. And we found that in mice that don't have platelets but have scleroderma, the neutrophils are less activated compared to the mice that have platelets. So when we deplate the, the platelet, when we remove the platelet, the neutrophils are less activated. So this shows that platelets are involved in the neutrophil activation during scleroderma. So then, once again, we wanted to confirm this process in a context of fibrosis. So we did a very um, elaborated experiment where we took healthy uh, neutrophils and we uh, co-cultured together with platelet, either healthy platelet or scleroderma platelet. And then we separated them from the neutrophils and only injected the neutrophil to a mouse. And when we inject the neutrophils to a mouse that were um, incubated with healthy platelets, the lungs look not so bad. But when we inject neutrophils that were in co-culture with neutrophils from a scleroderma platelet, the lung looks totally fibrotic. So this shows once again that the platelet activate the neutrophils that will in turn lead to fibrosis. So we ask how the platelet can activate the neutrophils. To be activated, the neutrophil needs energy. And we know that um, mitochondria in cell are the powerhouse of the cells. Mitochondria generate a lot of energy in the cells. So we were thinking maybe platelet can give the mitochondria to the neutrophils and uh, give them energy. So we have mice that uh, express fluorescent mitochondria only on the platelet, but not on the neutrophils. So if our hypothesis were, was good, we were able to see the transfer of the platelet mitochondria from the platelet to the neutrophils because the neutrophils should not have 
green uh, fluorescent mitochondria on in the platelet. And this is what we did. We used these mice and uh, induced cleoderma to those mice and uh, see if there were transfer of mitochondria. And this is what we, you will see here. In blue are the platelets, in green are the neutrophils, and in, in red are the neutrophils, and in green are mitochondria from platelets only. And this is a three-dimensional um, video of a neutrophil containing platelet from mitochondria. And we could uh, quantify the proportion of neutrophil containing platelet mitochondria during scleroderma and observe that there is an increase of this mitochondria transfer uh, during scleroderma with about 30% of neutrophil containing platelet mitochondria against about 7% in normal condition. So um, in conclusion, the data I show you today show that uh, during uh, scleroderma, there is a lot of fibrosis that include a lot of collagen buildup. This is this scarring uh, in the tissue. This will activate the collagen, and I didn't show it today, but we identified um, the receptor by which platelet activated. And activated platelet will release the mitochondria that in turn will be engulfed by the neutrophils an activated neutrophil will in turn enhance the fibrosis. And uh, this makes a loop to perpetuate disease progression in scleroderma. So uh, I think I am done for this presentation today. And I, will, I want to finish this presentation by uh, thanks my lab with my mentor, Peter Nigrovich, uh, the, people, the, the, the people that give me a patient sample and collaborator. Also, all the patients and healthy donors that uh, provided me uh, samples to make this project happening, uh, the INRF uh, and the GBC for this funding and the Scleroderma Foundation for uh, their mentoring program. Thank you very much. And I will take any uh, question or comment. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Darbusset. Pretty interesting story. I have a quick question about yes mitochondrial uptake by the neutrophils. So um, are they doing that through sort of standard receptor mediated endocytosis? So they're going into endosomes and is that, how do they get out to the cytosol so that they can be functional? So like, I'm not sure yet. What I know is that the, like the plate, the mitochondria from the platelet can fuse with the mitochondria from uh, the neutrophils. I know that they can fuse. I can find some platelet mitochondria alone. I do not see any vacuole around, but I haven't done, I haven't go that far into the, the process yet. I'm not sure how they transfer, but uh, I know they need contact because when I put a transfer with um, 0.4 micron pore, for example, they do not transfer. Uh, they really need the contact, but um, I, I have images that show the fusion between the two, but I'm, it's still a little bit unclear. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool. And yeah. I, one, one other question has to do with um, TH17 cells. So um, oftentimes when we think about neutrophil recruitment, there it usually accompanies you know, recruitment of TH17s and release of bile 17. Is, is that involved in in systemic scleroderma? And, and if so, is there any sort of potential for treatment using some of these inhibitors of IL-17 that are used for other um, auto-inflammatory and autoimmune diseases? Um, I, I'm not sure about that, to be honest, uh, but maybe. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, Emily, do we have any questions from anybody else that's out there or other folks on the panel? The other questions in the Q&A, but we'll continue to collect and um, can always come back to Dr. Darbusse as well as we move through our presentations. Great, okay. Thank you, Dr. Darbusse, really interesting work. Um, why don't we go ahead and move on to our next speaker, which is uh, Eliza Tso, who's from the um, Edward T. and, or she is the Edward T. and Ellen K. Dreyer Early Career Professor of Rheumatology and a research assistant professor at the Division of Rheumatology, Michigan Medicine. And Dr. So is going to pr uh, provide a talk entitled Halting Scleroderma Fibrosis, question mark, you bet. So Dr. So. 
Thank you so much. Everyone can see my screen? Yes. Awesome. Um, I would like to first thank ANRF for the invitation. Um, I received a funding from ANRF back in 2017, so it's really one of the first grants I received in my academic career, and for that, I'm very grateful. Um, today, I thought I will share with you some of our recent work um, focusing on scleroderma fibrosis in relationship to um, these BET proteins. But first, I'll give an overview on systemic sclerosis. Um, as, as our first speaker already alluded, it is a rare multi-system autoimmune disease. It is a very complicated disease and has a lot of different components that play in it. There is immune cell activation, as we heard in the first talk, um, blood vessel changes and blood vessel complications that come early on in disease, and also tissue thickening, or we call this fib uh, process fibrosis. There are many different subsets of this disease and treatment is uh, limited. So if we zoom into the patient's body and look at the cellular level, as I mentioned, their activation of these immune cells, there's um, um, blood vessel cells that form these leaky blood vessels that allow the immune cells to get into the tissue. But today we'll mainly focus on these tissue thickening cells. We call them fibroblasts. When they're super duper activated, we call them myofibroblasts. And these myofibroblasts will produce a lot of these tissue hardening substances, including collagen, that will lead to tissue thickening or fibrosis. And so I'm sure if there are patients listening in or family members of patients, at some point in the clinic, you donated skin biopsies. And from these skin biopsies, we can isolate different cell types that we can use directly in experiments to, find, to help us find potential drug targets for this disease. In our laboratory, we can routinely isolate two different types of cells. One is called the skin thickening cells or fibroblasts, and the other type is these blood vessel cells or endothelial cells. You can see under the microscope, they look fairly different. The skin thickening cells look more elongated and spindle-like. And today I'll show you how we can use these patient-derived cells, specifically these fibroblasts in experiments in the laboratory. In scleroderma or systemic sclerosis, we know that there is a genetic component in it, which means that if you have a family member with certain type of autoimmune disease, then the chances of you getting scleroderma would be higher. However, from twin studies, we know that not all identical twins with both have the disease is actually quite rare. And so we know that genetics itself cannot explain everything. In a patient, we need also some sort of environmental trigger together with epigenetic dysregulation for this disease to occur. So you might ask me, what is epigenetics? We're humans and we're made up of cells. In our cells, we contain these DNA or genetic materials that define who we are. I got genes from my parents and they, uh, they get, I look like my parents uh, with the black hair and brown eyes. And these are all encoded in the genetic material they gave me. For epigenetics, epi means above, genetics means genes. So we're really looking at these decorations on top of the gene level. You can think of these decorations, epigenetic marks as Christmas decorations and our gene body is the um, Christmas tree. And it's these, uh, it's these Christmas decorations that can work in a way to turn certain genes on or certain genes off. And that's how epigenetics can control cell function. Epigenetics is highly affected by environmental factors. So the food that we eat, whether we smoke or not, whether we exercise, whether we feel stressed out or not, all of these would change the Christmas decorations and would affect gene expression. One of the greatest example of epigenetic at work, as I mentioned earlier, is when identical twins are not identical anymore. So these are the Olsen twins. Um, they were quite famous when they were younger. They're identical twins, which means that they have the same genetic material, the DNA in them. That's why they look pretty much the same. But as they grow older, they might adopt different lifestyles. One might like burgers more, one might sunbathe more. And all of these differences in lifestyle would change the epigenetic marks, these Christmas decorations. And certain genes will be turned on in one twin, but maybe not the other. So over time, they would start to look different and different in appearance. And also this would lead to differences in health. There are different type of epigenetic mechanisms. And today we'll focus mainly on histones. Histones are these ball-like structures that have these tails sticking out, and on the tail is where the Christmas decorations would be. And um, these Christmas decorations can affect gene expression, turn genes on or off. 
There are different types of histone proteins, but today we'll focus on mainly histone readers. And these histone reader proteins will find their favorite Christmas decorations to bind to. And the BET proteins, which stands for bromo domain and extra terminal containing protein family, it is a type of histone reader. And it is a family, so it has different family members, including BRD2, 3, 4, and T. And so what these BET protein does is they will find their favorite Christmas decoration, which in this case are histone acetylation marks, and will bind to them and can turn certain genes on. So if we have an inhibitor that can dissociate the binding between these BET proteins from their favorite Christmas decorations, we can turn genes off. The BET proteins caught our interest because when we look through the literature, read a lot of papers, we found that the BET proteins have been implicated in a lot of different fibro fibrotic conditions. However, it has not been studied systemically in scleroderma. And so in our lab, we hypothesized that perhaps binding of these BET proteins to their favorite Christmas decorations can turn these genes on, and these genes are fibrotic genes that could uh, contribute to scleroderma fibrosis or tissue thickening. So if we have an inhibitor that can dissociate binding between the BT proteins from their favorite Christmas decorations, we can perhaps turn genes off and stop scleroderma fibrosis. So the inhibitor that I'll show you today is called JQ1, we use in our system. It is a pan-BET inhibitor, which means that it blocks all family members in the BET family, BRD2, 3, and 4. And I also should also mention that this drug is only um, used in laboratory as it is not um, approved for clinical use. So we'll come back to our patient-derived cells. Remember these skin thickening cells or fibroblasts in the Petri dish you look elongated. What we can do is we can grow them in a Petri dish and treat them with this inhibitor. And we can study how they change the, how this drug changes the behavior of these cells. We want these cells to behave more like healthy cells, normal cells, and not so much the profibrotic phenotype that they're showing um, when they are isolated from patient skin. So the first experiment that we did is look at whether we can turn fibrotic genes um, off. Remember these BT proteins would turn genes on. And so after treating this, these cells with this inhibitor, we wanna see the uh, expression go down. So we're comparing it to one. This is comparing it to non-treated cells. So everything is below one. These two fibrotic genes we chose here are below one, which means that these fibrotic gene expressions are blocked. So we turned off the gene expression by these inhibitors. The next experiment that we did is look at cell, cell growth. So we want the cells to grow, but we don't want them to be super activated. We want them to slow down a little. And so what we can do is we can measure cell growth um, this is the uh, y-axis, and we treated the cells with different doses of the inhibitor. And you can see that JQ1 dose dependently um, slow down the cells from growing, um, which is um, great for our system too. So the last experiment that I want to show you is called a cell migration assay. And believe it or not, these cells, when they're grown in Petri dish, they do move around. And so what we did here is we grew the cells in a Petri dish, and then we scratch the, the plate so that we wash away the cells in between. The cells here are labeled yellow in this movie so that you can see them better. And we can see over time how the cells would migrate into the gap that we created. And you can appreciate that the cells on the left was just non-treated versus the one on the right, which is treated with this drug. You can see that the drug treated cells move slower into the gap. And so all of these experiments has suggested that inhibition of these BET proteins show potent antifibrotic properties in these patient-derived cells. I don't have a lot of time to go into great detail what we did in this study. We did a lot more. Um, however, if you're interested in um, finding out more, I, this study is, is published. And if you uh, would like to a copy of this paper, I'm, uh, I would definitely send you um, by email. But here on the right-hand side is a summary of this um, study. In addition to patient-derived cells, we also worked with animal models. Um, and um, we showed that this um, PIN-JQ1 inhibitor can um, affect fibrosis in these mouse models also. 
And remember that the BET protein is a family of proteins. So we actually zoomed in and looked at each individual family member. And we found that it is the BRD4 isotype. This family member is causing this fibrotic effect. And so if we use BRD4 specific inhibitors, in this case, the AZT and ARV, and we can also show that this inhibitor um, can affect um, fibrosis in both patient-derived cells and an animal model. Um, with that, I would like to thank our patients. Without their participation in our study, none of this would be possible. I also like to thank my collaborators and colleagues um, in, at Michigan and outside of Michigan, and also the funding sources along the years, especially ANRF, which is one of the first grants I received. I'm very grateful for that. I also like to highlight Serapa here. She is the first author on this JCI Insight paper, which just, I just mentioned. She did most of the work here, and she uh, just graduated from as an undergraduate from Michigan, and she received the award for the highest scientific achievement she can get from the Division of Rheumatology. With that, I'll stop here, and um, thank you so much for your attention, and I'll take questions. All right, thank you, Dr. So. Um, so first off, I wanna thank you for providing that really nice um, schematic or explanation for how epigenetic signaling works. That's always tricky to figure out. Um, and sort of related to, the, to that, you know, this whole idea of epigenetics, I'm curious as to whether there are things, so you mentioned early on that there's things that are associated with lifestyle and, you know, for example, smoking or, or certain foods and so forth. Maybe you could comment a little bit on what's known about epigenetic, you know, the influence of some of these lifestyle choices and other, other environmental factors that, that can influence epigenetics. Yeah, um, I get that question a lot. So what can we do to kind of tune our epigenetics and ourselves? So a lot of studies have focused on lifestyles and the most studied I would say is on diet. And people also looked at exercise and vitamins, green tea, all of these things that we do in life would affect epigenetics. But I have to say that a lot of these studies that have been done before is on animal models and maybe in worms. And so not so much in humans. And so we do know that these epigenetic changes, whatever we do in life would affect epigenetic changes, but how much we can extrapolate those results that are done in, in a laboratory setting to humans. So how much that we do we have to eat? How long do we have to exercise? That's a question mark. So all we know I can say is um, we do, we recognize that these lifestyle choices would affect our epigenome and maybe our microbiome. Everything is so complicated in our body. So we do this healthy choices that we can, um, maybe only eat one candy bar at, on Halloween instead of five. Um, and then uh, recognize that whatever we do would help us with our epigenome. Um, but uh, when it comes to therapy, when it comes to epigenetic modifying drugs, if we have one that is approved, we will leave it to those medications that are tested in human and make sure they're safe and effective in a way to um, uh, treat this disease. I hope that kind of goes through what. Yeah, no, that's that's great. So, so kind of following up on on that point about specific drugs, I you know, I guess I don't I don't know that much about epigenetics. I mean, I know a little bit, but I've always sort of had this impression that you know, they were fairly um, broad. In other words, that that the inhibitors would have sort of a sort of a broad impact on lots of different uh, gene expression pathways. So are there more selective pathways that you can target? Yeah, so um, yes, you're right. Epigenetics, we call these drugs epigenetic modifying drugs. And because epigenetics involve in so many different aspects, so toxicity is always, or side effects is always one of the concerns. In our study, I can give you an example, the JQ1 um, that we use to treat our patient-derived cells. Uh, we did an RNA-seq, which is a technique where we extract the gen genetic material out, we put it to, through a machine, and we kind of look at what genes are turned on and turned off globally. And from JQ1 itself, we see more than 5,000 genes that are turned on and off. So not obviously not all 5,000 will be involved in fibrosis. So there is this concern of specificity and toxicity with these drugs. And there are ways to circumvent that. So people, for example, instead of looking at PAN-BET, we zoomed in on BRD4. So we're more specific in looking at that particular family member that is causing it. So we minimize the toxicity. We're not touching the BRD2 or 3. Another, another way that we can get away with this is look at 
further down the target gene. So in this paper, I didn't have time to look to, to, to touch on. We actually identified a target gene, which is involved in calcium signaling. So instead of like inhibiting everything on top, we target the small target genes on the bottom, then the toxicity can be minimized. Got it. Okay. Very cool. Um, any other questions from the panel or, or if we have any that are from, from the group that's online? You answered the few that came in online, uh, Dr. Walsh. Uh, great questions. I think the, the knowledge of the epigenetics is really interesting concept, I think, for our, our constituents to hear too about lifestyle and how that plays such a role in, in the effects of the disease. So, cool. All right. Um, well, uh, stand by just in case somebody else has some questions for you as we go. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on to our next speaker. And again, thank you, Dr. So. Very, very interesting work. Our next speaker is Brian Skog, who comes to us from the Division of Rheumatology at University of Texas Health Houston. Uh, and the title of his work is Understanding the Detrimental Effect of a Genetic Susceptibility Factor in Scleroderma. Uh, Dr. Skog. All right, thank you. I just wanna make sure everyone can see my slides. Yes. Yes, okay. perfect. Okay, very good. Well, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to present my research today. Uh, for me personally, uh, the, the support I received from the ANRF has had a major impact on my career as a physician scientist. I completed my rheumatology fellowship training and joined the faculty here at UT Health in Houston in 2018. And the grant I received from ANRF in 2019 was my first grant as well. And during my time as an ANRF scholar, uh, I was able to develop some traction and make progress in the research that I will present today. And the results from this research in turn were the cornerstone uh, for my application for a career development award from the National Institutes of Health that I received earlier this year, uh, which is focused on developing a better understanding of the pathogenesis underlying scleroderma. So I'm very grateful to the ANRF for their support. <clears throat> so as the other speakers uh, mentioned in their presentations, systemic sclerosis, commonly referred to as scleroderma, is a systemic autoimmune disease. It causes hardening or sclerosis of the skin, which is the basis of the name scleroderma, and it can also cause damage to the joints and the internal organs. The average age of systemic sclerosis onset is in the 40s, and systemic sclerosis diminishes quality of life and can be fatal. <clears throat> Current options for treatment can have a significant impact, uh, but oftentimes they are insufficient to control the disease and can also be difficult to tolerate for some patients due to side effects. The pathogenesis underlying systemic sclerosis is incompletely understood. Uh, prior research has shown that some of the susceptibility to systemic sclerosis comes from heritable genetic variants. And identifying these genetic risk variants and understanding how they contribute to systemic sclerosis has been a longstanding interest of the scleroderma program here at UT Health. And it provides a path to better understanding of the disease and it can strengthen the foundation for developing more targeted and effective therapies. My research as an ANRF scholar has been focused on one of these heritable genetic risk variants. This gene variant was identified as a risk factor for systemic sclerosis in 2014. Uh, two independent groups of investigators, one of which was led by uh, Dr. Maureen Mays, a, a faculty member here at UT Health in Houston, performed genetic association studies, examining thousands of systemic sclerosis patients and healthy controls for variants in the genetic sequence. And both groups identified a variant in a gene called DNAs1L3 associated with systemic sclerosis. And as you may know, uh, genes encode proteins and changes in the gene sequence can lead to changes in the structure and function of the proteins they encode. Uh, this gene variant results in an alteration of the protein structure of dnas one l 3 specifically a substitution of the amino acid arginine, abbreviated R, to cysteine, abbreviated C, at position 206. So this variant in the dnas one l 3 protein is abbreviated R206C. dnas one l 3 has a critical role in protection against autoimmunity. 
And this was first revealed when a mutation in DNAs 1L3 was identified in familial cases of systemic lupus erythematosus, another autoimmune condition. And the, the gene variant that results in the R206C substitution, in addition to being a risk factor for systemic sclerosis, was also identified as a risk factor for rheumatoid arthritis and for systemic lupus. And mice with genetic deletion of DNAs 1L3 spontaneously develop aberrant activity of the immune system in anti-nuclear antibodies, or ANA. So taken together, these studies show the importance of DNAs 1L3 in maintaining proper regulation of the immune system. The objective of my research is to determine how the DNAs 1L3 R206C variant increases susceptibility to systemic sclerosis. And I've broken down this objective into three specific questions. First, what are the key DNA targets of DNAs 1L3? DNAs are enzymes that can degrade or digest DNA. And therefore, to understand DNAs 1L3, we need to know what DNA it's targeting. Second, how does this R206C substitution affect the ability of DNAs 1L3 to digest these DNA targets? And lastly, if we can identify a population of DNA that is not properly digested by the R206C variant, how does this improperly digested DNA activate the immune system to predispose to autoimmune diseases like systemic sclerosis? We have focused on DNA in extracellular vesicles within the circulation. Vesicles are fragments of cells that can be released into the circulation when cells are activated or when they undergo cell death. When cells die as part of normal cell turnover within the body, vesicles containing components of the dying cell are released. And we have millions of these vesicles within our circulation. And it's important for our body to dispose of or recycle the material from dying cells in a way that does not trigger an immune response. Some of these vesicles contain DNA. So within our circulation, we have this DNA that needs to be digested and disposed of. In 2016, a group of investigators in New York showed that this DNA in circulating vesicles is a target of DNAs 1L3. In the healthy state, DNAs 1L3 is secreted into the circulation, digests DNA in the circulating vesicles. And as far as we know, this digested DNA poses no danger, or in other words, does not activate the immune system. What I've examined in my research is how the scleroderma-associated DNAs 1L3 R206C variant affects this process. To address this question, we used plasma samples from patients with systemic sclerosis who volunteered to participate in research. Plasma is what we get when we take a blood sample and spin down all of the cells to remove them. The remaining material is the plasma and it contains circulating proteins, including DNAs 1L3. To the plasma, we added vesicles that were isolated from dying cells in order to ask how much of the vesicle DNA can be digested within the circulation of patients with normal DNAs 1L3 in comparison to patients with the DNAs 1L3 R206C variant. And as shown in the graph on the right, in which each black dot represents one individual with systemic sclerosis, plasma from those with the DNAs 1L3 R206C variant had reduced ability to digest this vesicle DNA. The defect was largest in individuals homozygous for R206C, meaning that they have two copies of this variant, while there was a moderate defect in heterozygous individuals, people with one copy of the variant. Next, we used plasma samples to measure each individual's physiologic circulating DNA. And to estimate the extent to which the circulating DNA had been digested, we measured two fragment sizes. Short DNA fragments are those that have been digested by DNAs. Long DNA fragment sizes are those that have not been completely digested. So the ratio of long to short DNA fragments in a plasma sample is an estimation of the extent to which that individual's DNA has been digested. As shown in the graph, systemic sclerosis patients with two copies of the DNAs 1L3 R206C variant, shown on the right side in the right lane, <coughs> had a higher ratio of incompletely digested DNA on average than those without the variant. 
Again, those with one copy of the variant shown in the middle lane were in between. So in conclusion, we think that people who have the DNAs 103 R206C variant have a reduced ability to digest DNA within the circulation. And our primary focus in the lab now is identifying the effects of this incompletely digested DNA, and specifically whether it can trigger an immune response that contributes to the development of systemic sclerosis. I want to thank uh, my research mentor, Dr. Shervin Asasi, my colleagues and collaborators, uh, and the volunteers who served as participants in this research. Uh, and again, thank you to the ANRF for the opportunity. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Skog. Um, couple questions just to kind of follow up on that. So one is, you know, as I, we think about diseases like SLE, where oftentimes you, you develop these anti-nuclear antibodies and, and other sorts of um, autoreactivity that's kind of focused on the, on the nucleus. And, um, you know, this sounds kind of familiar to that. And in particular, there's one thing that is known to happen with SLE, which I'm not sure if that's the case and I guess that's my question is, do you see epitope, any evidence for epitope spreading sort of like what you see in the context of, of SLE? Um, that's a great question. Um, yes, I mean, the, the prototypical, I guess, ANA associated disease is SLE in which patients have numerous uh, autoantibodies. Uh, in systemic sclerosis, about 95% of patients have a positive ANA, uh, but most patients have um, only one of, of, of a set of um, key autoantibodies. Some patients uh, can have other antibodies, but for the most part, it's, it's more restricted. There are specific autoantibodies found in, in systemic sclerosis patients, not as broad as what, what occurs in SLE. So um, I think it's an interesting question and, and um, I'm, it's one that I'd like to be able to get at. I'm trying to kind of figure out a way experimentally to get at that question in, in systemic sclerosis. Um, so I, but right now I don't know if epitope spreading is part of the mechanism involved here. So, and, and then kind of related more specifically to the, the susceptibility allele. So, so you were saying that in mice that are completely deficient. I'm guessing that's a germline deficiency in DNase 1L3. That's correct. Those mice, those mice develop similar kinds of pathologies associated with systemic scleroderma, right? Uh, actually, no. I mean, the major phenotype okay. of the uh, mouse uh, with genetic deletion of DNase 1L3, they, they spontaneously develop autoantibodies. So there's clearly a loss of immune tolerance. And what the, what the investigators um, in New York showed, and, and also a, a, an independent group of investigators in Germany who have published on this, uh, in, in certain uh, genetic backgrounds, those mice can also develop a, an immune-mediated glomerulonephritis that has more of a, a resemblance to SLE. Mm -hmm. Um, as far as we know, or as far as I know, um, the mice do not spontaneously develop skin fibrosis or vasculopathy that would be uh, suggestive or, or consistent with what we see in systemic sclerosis. Although uh, I think it remains to be determined if we, if we challenge a mouse lacking DNAs 1L3 with a, with a fibrotic stimulus like bleomycin, for example, would it be more predisposed? That, that's something we'd also like to get at experimentally if they have a predisposition, if they're challenged with an environmental stimulus. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. So just out of curiosity, is the the mutation, right? So it's a, uh, what, what did I write down? It's an arginine to cysteine mutation. Does that's that correct. does that completely ablate the activity of the DNA or does it sort uh, of change its, its sort of specificity or what, what do you guys know about that? Yeah, that's that a interest? great question. Um, so there were data um, from, from our uh, study that I didn't show today regarding that question. And and there's also a, another group of investigators that has recently published on this, that um, if you substitute that arginine with a cysteine, uh, cells have a, a reduced ability to secrete DNAs 1L3 extracellularly. So it's as if it kind of gets stuck mm. inside the cell rather than secreted. 
And we think that's important because we, we think one of the major places where it has its effect, where it targets, uh, where its targets are, is within the circulation. So if it can't be secreted properly, then it can't get out to where it's supposed to act. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, do we have any other questions from other folks on the panel? All right, Emily, did, did we have any other questions that popped up in the uh, from the from the other folks that are involved in this? A, a question about the DNA and and I'm not sure exactly uh, how to put this based off the question, but is the goal to find basically like a blood test to determine if you are more predispositioned to have more or less DNA when you, once you have scleroderma or, or even before you're diagnosed with scleroderma? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, the major goal and the premise for why we're studying this DNA and this, this um, genetic variant that predisposes to scleroderma, we're hoping that it will present uh, a, a target that we could, that we could take advantage of um, for development of new therapies, whether that has to do with targeting that circulating DNA or targeting something downstream that in, in the immune system, which is, which is activated by that excess DNA. But it is also, it, it potentially, uh, I mean, I guess, I think this depends on what we find out ultimately uh, or what other investigators in the field uh, find out um, as far as whether we could use uh, the DNA uh, variant as sort of a genetic test to help to assess the risk for someone to develop an autoimmune condition like scleroderma. I think there, there may be potential there, but it's too early to say whether, whether we could use uh, something like that in practice. This genetic variant, like, like a lot of genetic variants in these, in these com complex diseases like scleroderma, it, does, it confers sort of a modest elevated risk for the disease. Okay. It's, so scleroderma is not a genetic disease, as, as you know. Um, in, in the sense that it's a single gene and, and highly predictable who will get the disease. It's more of an issue of elevated risk. So okay. it's not quite at the level, I don't think, where we could just take a test of this variant and predict who's going to go on and develop an autoimmune condition. Sure. Very interesting. Right. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, thank you, Dr. Skog. And thank you for to all of our presenters today. Really, really exciting work. Um, I think one thing that I'd like to end with before we have Emily finish out the meeting is just that I think all of you guys heard about the impact that the ANRF has had on on our scholars and um, you know the there's a couple of thoughts about that I mean one of course we're we're funding really really important research like you guys heard about today but on top of that we're funding scholars who go on in their careers and continue to make impacts throughout their careers and we think that that's a really important um, that's a really important goal of the organization to make sure that we we promote um, really really smart people like we've heard from today, who then go on to do amazing things in um, you know in trying to treat this horrible disease as well as some of the related um, diseases that um, that we're all interested in. So, with that, again, thank you all to our speakers. Uh, Emily, you want to finish us out? Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Walsh. I couldn't have said it better myself, but just. Uh, I want to echo Dr. Walsh's sentiments about the work that our scholars are doing, particularly in a disease like scleroderma where there are so few therapies and it's exciting to see work progressing to hopefully find some additional targets that can help us develop some new treatments. So um, thank you to our presenters today. Thank you to Dr. Walsh. Thank you to all of you for joining this great event. We are so grateful for you taking the time to be with us today. If you enjoyed this webinar, we kindly ask that you consider making a donation today by visiting curearthritis.org forward slash donate. Every contribution helps. And please remember to follow us on social media as well to stay connected. Thank you so much and have a great day.